This conference will now be recorded. So share is the Is that do you see the whole slide? No, we see like half of the half of the slide. Yeah. Oh. What if I do the whole screen and let me close my emails and stuff? So I'm sorry for technical difficulties. How about now? Perfect. Okay. So thank you, Hesse, for having me. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction. I realize that we're a few minutes in, so I will try to get through the slide a little bit faster. Um, and I think I mentioned to uh, um, the Hesse colleagues uh, uh, late last week that I'm not super familiar with uh, ESTAR, even though I am very familiar with Hesse and I've had the pleasure uh, of working with HESI many years ago. In fact, in the early days of Siome, uh, the company that Scott introduced, um, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Cyril and uh, another colleague uh, on something completely different. So uh, I'm very glad to have reconnected with HESI and uh, glad to be here discussing transcriptomic read across um, for mechanism of action characterization. Um, so, uh, just as a quick introduction, as Scott said, I work at Siom. We are a small data analytics informatics company in RTP. Um, and the research we do is generally divided into these five categories of bioinformatics, cheminformatics and computational toxicology, text mining, data science, where we do a lot of predictive science, apply machine learning and deep learning for predictive purposes. And then we also have a very robust software development team. So, a lot of the methods development work uh, that I'll talk about today happens within our bioinformatics practice area, but we are a small company, so people in uh, all of these different uh, uh, practice areas contribute towards uh, research uh, and methods development. And, and as the methods uh, get more uh, mature and have repeatable use, uh, our software team uh, takes an active participation and turns it into a software product that uh, that all of us can use easily. So our team uh, has grown, uh, about 25 full-time informaticians, half of us have PhDs, uh, at least a master's, and uh, all of us uh, are programmers. We, we write code, you know, we develop, like to develop methods, analyze data, and publish. And I've been very lucky working actually with Scott for a very long time and NTP and other uh, agencies uh, and have published a lot of a uh, lot of articles. Um, so for today, I thought that I'll I'll pick a topic that is one of the active areas of research within our group, and I thought also kind of fits nicely within the um, the mission statement that I read on ESTAR's website. And I think this is why initially, probably um, uh, Allison um, um, uh, suggested. Uh, this topic for for the eStar seminar, and I think that's how I got in touch with uh, uh, Carolyn and and Cyril, and we decided to uh, to have this uh, seminar uh, or the webinar uh, arranged. Um, so for uh, today's uh, topic, I have decided to talk about the high throughput transcriptomics data analysis pipeline. As most of you on this committee know, uh, transcriptomics is increasingly being used in toxicology and risk assessment in uh, especially in hazard identification purposes. I'm not a toxicologist, but having worked with uh, many toxicologists uh, like Scott and a lot of NTP folks, um, I've learned a little bit of toxicology and, and, and I've definitely seen firsthand use of various different transcriptomics platforms for the purpose of safety assessment. Um, so I want to uh, sort of you know, brainstorm with you guys how transcriptomics data could potentially be used for a purpose that is very similar to a traditional read across application. Um, and uh, if time permits, which probably given where we are now, we probably won't have a lot of time, but I could have talked uh, a bit about our causal inference method development that we are doing. Um, so I kind of thought that this topic area fits nicely within this new translational and predictive tools uh, area of the eStar mission. Uh, but please uh, feel free to, um, 
Um, uh, I see some uh, messages uh, saying that others yeah. cannot hear me. Uh, can someone confirm? We can hear you. Okay, so there are some uh, messages on the text. I think Pierre just sent a message saying, can anyone hear? Um, so, uh, so with that, I just wanted to say that uh, toxicology, um, toxicogenomics has evolved over time, mostly in terms of what platforms are being used. Um, and having worked in this domain for close to 15 years now, uh, we've had the, the uh, opportunity to work on many different platforms for related but different applications. Um, so as I said, uh, in our publication history, uh, we've, we've had lots of publications that cover many of these different platforms. Um, uh, in early days, microarrays uh, were considered new and we've analyzed a lot of microarrays data. Uh, even working with Scott, we've developed some biomarkers using machine learning uh, that can very accurately identify flavoring agents uh, into different categories of toxicological interest. Uh, and then we've analyzed a lot of RNA-seq data. Um, and recently, or more recently, in the last couple of years, uh, we've gotten uh, our hands dirty with TempoSeq data, which is a, uh, a variant of RNA-seq pipeline where instead of sequencing the whole length of the gene, we are particularly focused on 50 base pair regions uh, or particular probes uh, that you measure. So you get RNA-seq type count data uh, that can be analyzed for toxicological purposes. Uh, the advantage of TempoSeq is that, um, that you can you know, get more sequencing done for less money since you're not sequencing the whole gene. Um, and so in the recent past, we've published some papers uh, where we uh, worked on selection of thousand or a couple of thousand genes uh, that are most informative uh, instead of uh, having to sequence the whole transcriptome to further reduce the cost. Um, uh, and, and we've described our bioinformatics approach for gene selection and how to then extrapolate expression of a couple of thousand genes to the whole transcriptome to computationally create the whole transcriptome. Um, uh, and particularly uh, research in my, uh, in my group has focused on developing a very robust pipeline for analysis of TempoSeq data. And even there, we've had some publications in the last couple of years, uh, the, the S1500 gene selection, followed by extrapolation and the utility of whole transcriptome data. And then uh, papers that uh, actually Scott and colleagues at NTP have led have shown that uh, these S1500 TempoSeq data can be used uh, for benchmark dose analysis and how uh, the uh, benchmark dose or BMRs uh, or the potencies calculated here correlate pretty well uh, with uh, apical endpoints uh, data uh, collected from traditional toxicology experiments. Um, and then uh, in the last year or so, uh, we have been working on developing a network analysis or perturbation network analysis method that we believe with further research can be used for read across type application where the underlying data is transcriptomics data. So before I get into that uh, read across portion or the network analysis method, which is what I want to focus on today a lot more, I just want to very quickly walk you through uh, a typical toxicogenomics data analysis pipeline. In this case, I'm talking about TempoSeq, but our workflows within Siom uh, are pretty platform agnostic. So instead of TempoSeq, if you have um, RNA-seq data or any other particular platform, um, our, our, our pipeline is very modularized and we, we can swap out components to make it fit for the type of data we're dealing with. And you'll see that uh, as I go through my slides that we now have um, a ton of microarray RNA-seq and TempoSeq data that we are trying to combine for inference uh, purposes. So, so in, uh, in our TempoSeq data analysis workflow, uh, which is actually very similar to TempoSeq analysis workflows that you may have seen in recent publication from, from EPA and also from a um, from couple of other groups in Europe, uh, it begins with, uh, with alignment of the data, very robust quality control, normalization, data visualization, and some of these steps are sort of uh, iterative steps where, uh, where you do some visual inspection, you run quality checks, you remove some outliers, and then you renormalize data. Uh, and once uh, QC data, read uh, the count data is ready and normalized, it moves into the extrapolation step. So if you've used a, uh, a subset of the transcriptome like the S1500 platform, 
then we can extrapolate from 2,000 genes to the 25,000 genes. So you now have a computationally generated full transcriptome data, which can then move into the downstream analysis methods. And the downstream methods, especially how you identify differentially expressed genes or, or how you do pathway analysis are now pretty standard these days. Um, so we focused our efforts on developing uh, other downstream analysis methods that we think are, uh, are needed uh, for the type of research that people want to pursue these days. Uh, and one particular method is network analysis. Uh, again, uh, mostly used for read across or mode of, mode of action characterization. Uh, and, uh, and also those response analysis methods, which Scott, I'm sure, have presented to you numerous times. Uh, the BMD Express uh, tool and methodology underlying BMD Express is also an active area of research within our group. Uh, and we're very lucky to be able to work with Scott to further develop BMD Express uh, to support benchmark growth analysis. So um, not spending a whole lot of time on details, but uh, to look at the first half of the pipeline, um, uh, we have very robust workflows that go through many different steps for conducting QC. Um, we actually have a manuscript in work that talks about how uh, normalization and alignment algorithms are selected. Um, for the QC workflow, uh, we have a, almost a fully semi-automated um, um, sort of a process uh, which, which does take human um, input to work through many different aspects of what is required for, for a robust QC of TempoSeq. Uh, and it generates a lot of different flags at different steps that can be used to decide whether a particular sample or a group of samples are considered outliers and what might be the reason for them to be outliers and therefore can uh, the, uh, you know, the, the person running the project can decide whether to keep those samples. Um, uh, when it comes to the choice of uh, alignment algorithms, uh, as I said, we have a manuscript in, 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 uh, in making but we uh, analyzed uh, six different aligners and, and compared the results with each other. Uh, all aligners pretty much gave us very similar answers. Uh, and similarly, we also uh, decided to test different normalization approaches uh, using some publicly available TempoSeq data and concluded that simpler aligners and simpler normalization methods are giving the most accurate answers. Um, so our choice of normalization has always been reads per million uh, or RPM. Uh, and if the data has a lot of variation, then we do RPM followed by quantile normalization. But as you can see, uh, no matter what aligner or normalization method you choose, you're, gonna, you, you're, you're pretty much going to get very similar answers. So moving on to the downstream sort of part of the TempoSeq analysis pipeline, um, I mentioned extrapolation um, can be used to take uh, 2,000 genes and predict rest of the transcriptome, um, and then perform other downstream analyses, like uh, identifying what pathways are active and then performing network analysis. So um, if you're interested in extrapolation, if your organization uses S1500 platform, then we have three manuscripts now published, which describes the method uh, and the utility of extrapolation. Uh, please reach out to me and I can uh, discuss more details with you, uh, but I wasn't planning on focusing on this particular aspect of the method or algorithm in today's presentation, uh, but instead talk about the perturbation network analysis method. Um, so this is the method uh, that uh, is in active uh, R&D within our group, um, and um, uh, the, the general goal or the, the hope is to be able to quantitate and visually uh, inspect relatedness, uh, relatedness between different transcriptomic samples um, in this gigantic transcriptomic signature database that we are creating, right? So um, the idea is actually uh, very similar to uh, the connectivity map uh, approach that many of you might be familiar with. Uh, so Broad Institute uh, has a method called CMAP or connectivity map. Uh, which uh, is using their uh, expression data generated from L1000 platform. Um, and uh, the concept is, is, is very, uh, 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 very much similar to connectivity map and the credit goes to them uh, that, um, that they have created a framework where you can compare uh, your L1000 signature with a, with a very large signature of other L1000 data sets, uh, and if you find another data point that has very similar transcriptomic profile, 
uh, then you can perhaps do read across and make a prediction on, on the activity of, uh, uh, of your compound compared to the database. Um, so the, the purpose here is to match differential expression result against a vast database of known signatures. Um, the, the difference uh, in our approach to connectivity map is in, uh, is in the signature data that we use, um, as well as the method that we use for comparing two different signatures with each other. Um, uh, and, and, and we have a visualization approach using uh, a technology that we've developed at Scion called Dataverse that allows for uh, millions of these data points to be clustered instantaneously, and it provides an interactive uh, user interface. So you can, you as a biologist or a toxicologist, uh, can go in and view this data uh, in an interactive fashion for a more detailed interpretation. So uh, I will try to walk through these three components, uh, what signature data we have, um, um, what uh, type of data, what kind of processing of the data that we've done, um, uh, and what we plan to do to, to do more to keep increasing the size of the data. And then what methods we have for scoring um, uh, there are multiple scoring and significance methods that are under uh, under active R&D, uh, and I'll go through very briefly uh, what those methods look like. Uh, and then if the time permits, uh, I would like to show you uh, probably even live demo of the visualization using one case study. Um, so are there any questions at this point before I move on to the next slide? Just wanted to take a pause and see um, if there are any burning questions so far. No? Okay. Um, I'm assuming somebody uh, from HESI is monitoring the uh, chat, right? Because I cannot see those chat in this presentation mode. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, now I can move to the next. All right. Um, so, I wanted to touch on these three uh, main components of what makes uh, the, the, the PNA or the network analysis methodology, starting with the data. Uh, so in terms of signature data, our goal is to assemble as large uh, as possible toxical genomic signature database from public domain transcriptomics uh, data sets. Um, and we are aiming uh, to create a signature database for four species, human, rat, mouse, and zebrafish. Uh, because you know we see that at least uh, in, in the talks and the safety assessment community, these are, or, or overall in drug development, these are the, the main species of interest. Uh, and the process that we have followed um, is actually pretty rigorous uh, and takes a lot of effort and time. Um, so for each of these species, uh, we have decided to identify data sources by going to the public, uh, publicly available data sources like the gene expression omnibus, or the short read archive, or in, in cases like RAT, uh, specific or, or mouse specific databases which provide access to data like the TG gates and the drug matrix and the such. Um, and, um, and we try to procure raw data along with the metadata and the annotation for each of these uh, data sets uh, for species. So for example, for human, we are relying very heavily on data from GEO and Short Read Archive and a couple of other um, um, online resources that have archived data from various different resources. Uh, we try to get the raw data so that we can process this data using a very standard pipeline to avoid any data processing uh, differences that might lead to differences towards the, uh, the, the network analysis results. And we also try to get the metadata so that we know what data we have, we can do proper pairing of samples, uh, the non-controls with the controls, so we can calculate um, fold change values from these signatures and p-values, uh, and then we run it through our standard process to compute signatures. So as you can, uh, those bioinformaticians on the call can appreciate, this is uh, a, a very time-consuming process that has been going on sort of in the background in parallel um, for, for a number of years where, where we have captured data and processed it and kept it ready and turned it into signatures so we can populate uh, our signature database. So just to give you a, a summary of what the data looks like, uh, the version 1.0, I think it might be 1.5 or something now, um, 
Um, the, the main uh, technology platforms for human signatures are the four obvious ones, right? Microarray, RNA-seq, you can imagine. Also, TempoSeq data is starting to become available. And L1000, right? Pro Institute has a lot of L1000 data uh, where they've used uh, various different human cell lines conducted in vitro experiments, uh, and this data is available. So our goal is to combine all transcriptomics data from all major microarray and RNA-seq platforms and also then combine TempoSeq and L1000. In the first version or one of the earlier versions of our human signature database, we will focus mostly on the microarray and L1000. These are both sort of like hybridization-based, array-based platforms. Um, so in case of microarray, we've taken mostly all affymetrics HU133. These are the, this is the whole transcriptome human affymetrics platform, the most prevalent one, uh, curated uh, and annotated all the samples. Uh, we have a team of curators uh, who are, uh, they are mostly PhD or master's level uh, biologists and life scientists who, who do, uh, and they do this curation work. Um, and, they, uh, and the curation is very important so you can match the, the controls to the non-controls in, in, in an accurate manner. Uh, and using that information, then we start with the raw data we run it through our standard analysis pipeline and we create signatures. Uh, so we have about 45,000 signatures from microarray platform. Uh, and then we've taken the L1000 data, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the largest earlier available L1000 data set. We started with the bead level intensity values, uh, you know, L1000, even though it says 1000, it actually measures 978 landmark genes. Um, so there were 1.7 million samples with, uh, after processing, they uh, gave us about half a million differential expression signatures. Uh, but one uh, unique thing that we did is instead of just uh, using the 978 genes, we, we decided to use our own extrapolation algorithm because we have it, we've tested it, we've validated it, we know it works pretty well. Um, so we took the 1,000 or 978 genes ran it through our extrapolation algorithm and created full transcriptome or whole transcriptome profiles, which gives us about 25,000 genes for all of these L1000 profiles. So with that, we have about half a million total human uh, gene signatures. Uh, and this is some very high level general description of what type of experiments are involved, uh, are included in this half million set. So you can see about 300,000 different chemicals, uh, under 10,000 ligands, some SHRNA or CRISPR-based loss of function type of experiments, uh, and, and also various different control conditions are included here. So this is a pretty uh, diverse and robust data set. Uh, and obviously, we were very happy to have that in our hands. And we've tried it uh, and, and used it for a, for a few different projects over the last year or so. Um, but this is not all, right? The, the work uh, is still under progress uh, to come up with the newer version of the human signature database. Uh, I should say work in slow progress uh, because this is something that happens sort of in the background uh, and it's not the main focus uh, of our research, but we are uh, still aiming to add about, a, uh, about 1 million RNA-seq samples uh, that are deposited in GEO. This is mostly Illumina HiSeq or NexSeq uh, platforms. Um, and we are actually about a third of a way in, um, and, and we plan on adding this uh, to our human signature database. And there are some additional microarray platforms that are outside of the uh, Epimetrics HU133. There are some Illumina and Agilent platforms, which will give us another 400,000 or so signatures. Uh, and L1000 has some newer data set uh, with about 3 million uh, additional samples, which will add another million signatures. So when these data sets, uh, as you can see, we are probably a third or a quarter or uh, less than halfway into these uh, processing these signatures, we'll end up with a pretty large human signature database, which will have about 720,000 different chemical profiles uh, and so on and so forth, as you can see. Uh, so we anticipate that by combining all this data, uh, of course, there is some work to be done to make sure there are no platform differences. Uh, but, but, but by having this data set, we'll end up with a very diverse signature database that hopefully will include uh, many different environmental exposure scenarios, um, you know, failed or approved drug candidates if, if those data sets are there, um, uh, many other drug-like molecules, 
uh, at various different doses or time series experiments, uh, and also uh, lots of different disease versus normal comparisons. So disease conditions and progression scenarios uh, would hopefully be included here, which will give us a very nice uh, signature database to compare against to do the read across. Um, so, so this is sort of the summary of the human signature data that we have. Uh, in terms of RAT as a model system, the, uh, the first and the second version uh, includes uh, primarily uh, microarray platforms and some RNA-seq data from public domain. Um, so the RAT signature database, as you know very well, drug matrix and TG gates are very well known, and they have fantastic data uh, from toxic uh, toxicological research perspective. So we have certainly taken that data, uh, which gives both in vivo and in vitro experiments uh, in these five major uh, different tissue types, um, and about 500 plus uh, different chemicals at various different doses uh, and durations. Um, and then if we add some uh, public RNA-seq or TempoSeq data, we can almost double the signature database size uh, for read across to be done in RAT. Um, and we have similar efforts in, uh, in, in, in mouse and, and zebrafish, but, but I've skipped that for, um, ah, this is my, working slide so we can remove these things. <laughs> We're um, all work in progress, right? <laughs> I know, yeah, especially me. <laughs> so, um, so, so with RAT, uh, I think we have, uh, we have a much smaller but still a pretty robust toxic, uh, toxicology focus uh, signature database that we use for read across purposes. Um, so, moving from uh, what data we use for read across to the methodology. Uh, I hear someone. someone have a question, maybe? No? Okay. Um, so, talking about the, the metrics or, or the method uh, that can be used for comparing a query signature. So, let's say you've done an experiment, you, you have a chemical of choice. Uh, you have some controls and a couple of different doses of your chemical. Uh, you use microarray or RNA-seq or TempoSeq, and now you want to find um, what other experiments in the public domain have very similar transcriptomic profile to your experiment. So your experiment is a query, and we have all these signatures in our signature database. So what method can be used to, to compare them, right? Um, so, so we've looked at various different methods uh, and tried to kind of break them down into three major categories uh, because, you know, we really like to do methods research. We're constantly uh, reading and learning about these methods. Um, so uh, a methodology that we use very commonly, and, and I also use it, uh, it's, it's also included in a very you know, commonly used tools such as ingenuity pathway analysis is the Fisher's exact test. Um, in a way, it's very useful and powerful, but it's also kind of utilizing uh, the least amount of information because you're, you're taking a list of genes and comparing with another list of genes and looking for overlap and seeing whether that, that overlap is statistically significant or not. Um, so we consider that sort of like the least information rich method metric to compare a query to a target signature. Uh, something that has moderate amount of information uh, is a methodology that's included in the in the CMAP or the connectivity map. So connectivity map uh, approach uses uh, a connectivity score where uh, differential expression, uh, differentially expressed genes um, from only um, uh, the query is utilized, but not from the target signature. Um, but we are focused on a couple of methods that are under active uh, R&D within our group that carries more information. Uh, and there are a couple of other methods like the outlier sum score and running Fisher exact test score that are also what we consider as a uh, more information rich methods, but they have a lot of uh, computing limitations as to how computationally burdensome they are. So we're developing a couple of methods, uh, uh, concurrent activity score and rank biased overlap significance score. Uh, and I'll show you uh, uh, a, at least one case study where we've applied this method successfully. Um, the, you know, the simplest way to explain uh, the, this method is that it, it uses differential expression of all genes in your query. So you're looking at the full differences uh, and significance of all of the genes in your query. And we also look at all of the genes, the full transcriptome profile of all of the genes and their whole change differences 
in the target signature. So you're not comparing just the list of differentially expressed genes with a smaller sort of pathway definition. You're instead comparing the full list of genes, both in the query and the target signature, and applying some statistics to find uh, statistical overlap. Um, so um, uh, some, some of the key differences uh, is that um, the R method uh, provides a symmetry uh, because we are comparing the whole signatures uh, in, in the query and the target. Um, if you use your data as a query and you, you find something in the signature database that's a great mix, uh, that's a great match, or if you flip that, you would still get the same answer. Whereas the methodology that's currently included in the connectivity map cannot do that just because of the, the way their method works. The other key advantage of our approach is that our approach is platform agnostic. So unlike uh, connectivity map, which works beautifully on, on L1000 data, um, our, our method is, is platform agnostic. You could be running an RNA-seq or even a microarray uh, um, analysis and come in with a query and perform network analysis and get your results. Um, we also are supporting cross-species analysis. Uh, so you could, uh, for example, perform uh, an in vivo five-day study in RAT um, and generate your, um, your transcriptomic profile, but, but you want to conduct your network analysis against the human signature database because we have you know, close to half a million signatures in human, that is possible. Uh, we haven't really quite come across that as a possibility, definitely not in the connectivity map uh, approach. Um, and we're not using any black box data for standardizing uh, the p-values or to, do, to, to normalize any data. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, our, our methodologies are going through a publication, but both the data use and the method use uh, is, is, is very, um, is open and visible and, and, and has a very clear definition. So there is, no, um, there is no adjusting of the data happening through some kind of a proprietary data set. So, um, the, the third sort of major area of difference in our approach is the visual display uh, and the ability to interactively view the results. Um, and so once we perform the, uh, the transcriptomic uh, read across through this network analysis method, uh, we display the results through uh, an interface that looks like this on a, on a web browser. Um, and you can interactively view sort of like Google Maps, um, all of the million signatures in the database and your signature that is clustered in there and, and, and view the uh, environment uh, around your signature to see what other data points are, are nearby. And, and, and that's what really uh, sort of gives you the basis for conducting the transcriptomic read across. Um, so some of the unique aspects of uh, why we are excited about this uh, uh, interactive visualization application is because uh, we have uh, our, our computer scientists at Siom have, uh, have developed a Dataverse engine that can cluster millions of data points. So if you look at uh, something like uh, um, Cytoscape, uh, Cytoscape or, or some of the other um, uh, commonly used network visualization methods, they have limitations on how many total nodes and uh, edges you can have uh, for visualization perspective. Um, their, their methods usually say that anything more than you know, 10,000 or some data points is going to severely slow down their ability to cluster and organize and let you uh, manipulate that data set um, um, in, an, in a real-time fashion. Whereas uh, our tool can actually handle uh, millions of data points uh, with almost uh, uh, sort of uh, instantaneous refresh rate, uh, and it is scalable, so we can continue to add more data. And we can also add new features uh, to allow for various different types of metadata to be visible um, as you interactively view the results. So you can see, uh, as an example, all of the data that is loaded in here is indexed. So you can do all kinds of searches, uh, like the Google searches, uh, uh, and, and identify data and metadata very easily. Uh, and you can also hover over data points and, and get a lot of metadata information, where each data point here is a transcriptomic signature. So all I wanted to say is, is that uh, this platform can, uh, can consume and, and organize millions of data points, uh, perform clustering in real time, uh, and give you instantaneous refresh rates uh, uh, with data indexed so that you can perform searches and have some customizations built. 
So uh, let's look at a case study so I can show you what the results look like. Um, and I was hoping actually uh, when we first decided to do this webinar to, to use a few different case studies, but some of them are not published. Um, so I decided to just use one data set, which is actually published, um, Scott and uh, Will Gwynn and um, um, others at NTP have published this, uh, this uh, TempoSeq data set last year. Uh, where they, uh, they have a great paper where they showed that a uh, five-day rat in vivo study uh, performed with 20, a set of 20 chemicals, uh, the uh, differential expression and the benchmark dose analysis, uh, especially the, the benchmark dose values, uh, were agreeing pretty well with uh, apical endpoints. Um, so we decided to use this data set as a case study, uh, which includes P4 as one of the compounds, uh, and we ran it, uh, we ran the TempoSeq data, this was S1500 platform, through this uh, workflow that I showed you in the earlier part of my presentation. Um, so we, we, we performed the alignments and the QC and the normalization and, and extrapolation and, and used the, um, the uh, whole transcriptome data to perform this uh, perturbation network analysis uh, and, and perform the 3D visualization. Um, this was done, uh, this was a five-day RAT study. So in our perturbation network analysis, we uh, did the network analysis against the RAT version one uh, data set, signature data, uh, and we used our uh, RBOS methodology to calculate scores and p-value significance. Um, and um, this is what the results look like. So the uh, network analysis performed within these 20 chemicals uh, confirmed that P4, which was one of the chemicals in the study, uh, the focus of this case study, uh, is mechanistically similar or most similar to phenofibrate, DEHP, and triclosan, which are all known peroxisome proliferators. Uh, this is just a poorly uh, done screenshot of what those uh, samples clustered and what the clustering looks like. Um, I'll try to show you uh, live on the browser in a minute. Um, but what, what this shows um, <clears throat> in this uh, 2D capture of a 3D image is that P4 clustered with, with other compounds, uh, which are known peroxisome proliferators, uh, and, and this sort of gave the first indication or, or confirmed the, one of the modes of action of P4. The other good thing, which kind of also gave us uh, a good confirmation about the method, is that among the 20 chemicals uh, were chemicals like, uh, or the treatments like ginseng, and milk thistle extract, uh, which were sort of considered as, uh, at least the milk thistle extract was considered as negative control from what I, would, I understand. Um, and you can see that it clusters farthest away from the cluster uh, th that includes P4 and some of these other compounds. Again, showing that um, the network analysis methodology is able to capture uh, the similarity or differences among these treatment groups. Um, further close-up of this uh, 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 same analysis uh, from a different angle uh, shows that um, there were eight different doses of P4 used in this study, um, and you can see that uh, the lower doses were further away from cluster, which has other fibrates. But as you go closer to this cluster, you can see the closest match with the fibrates was the highest dose. Um, so this sort of an arrangement of doses. Uh, in, in a completely data-driven manner uh, gave us further confidence that our uh, analysis approach and the metric that we are using for doing this quote-unquote read across uh, is, is on the right track. Uh, and, um, and this kind of allowed us, one, to confirm uh, that P4 seems to have a P par alpha or P par gamma uh, type of uh, activity. Um, and uh, the P4 proximal neighbors uh, included uh, some other chemicals. Um, these chemicals are known activators of cyclooxygenase and aldoketoreductase pathways. Um, so, um, you know, this sort of uh, other toxicologists in the group uh, were pretty pleased to see that a, a data-driven approach uh, identified uh, fibrates as the closest neighbor of PFOA uh, and some other uh, chemical groupings that were the second closest cluster uh, gave an indication of perhaps a second um, uh, less well-known mechanism of action uh, for PFOA. 
So a conclusion here was that the, the hypothesis for primary mode of action of PFOA was verified uh, and further less well characterized or established mode of action of PFOA was identified. Um, so we hope that you know, this result uh, along with a couple of other case studies that we have, which I'm not able to, to share with you today, uh, at least for us, it serves as a proof of concept for characterizing modes of action of chemical toxicants um, using uh, transcriptomics data and, and bioinformatic approach that I showed you. Um, and um, perhaps, uh, you know, if the time permits now, I can uh, show this uh, live version to you uh, and show you what it looks like. Um, so can you see my browser? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is the, um, if I zoom in, I will probably have to adjust the graph setting. So this is the live version of Dataverse that I was uh, describing to you. Um, you can adjust many of the colors and shapes. Um, right now, the um, the color key is uh, is chemical, so you, so all the nodes are colored by chemical, uh, and and uh, there are various different graph settings that you can apply. Um, and uh, the 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 data set that we have loaded is the the rat signature database. So there are about fifteen thousand or so rat signatures. Um, but on top of that, we've taken this. Um, now published uh, 20 chemical study from Will Gwynn and, and Scott Auerbach and others. Uh, and those uh, samples that were loaded can be seen here. Um, and I'm just going to select the PFOA liver samples at a high dose. Uh, that's, that's this. Um, and since I'd already um, clicked on it once, you can see that it's, uh, it's, this is the selected data point, so it's in red. But you can see other data points. This is the PFOA at dose seven. So th this is the highest dose, dose eight. This is dose seven. This must be dose six and dose five and so on and so forth. So if I zoom in um, and, and rotate through it, you can see you can, you can sort of visually inspect the closest neighbors. Uh, you also get a flat file result. So you get an Excel file where you will see for a given transcriptomic signature, which is your query, what are the closest neighbors, what is the score, what is the p-value, um, but this is the visual representation of the same. Um, so if this was the signature of your interest, let's say because it's the highest dose in, in liver, you can see what are the closest neighbors um, and you can hover over them and read. So these uh, purple ones, for example, are the high doses of phenofibrate, uh, which was one of the key findings uh, and that, you know, you know, these fibrates have I think they are the p -par agonists um, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, this is, uh, you know, just wanted to kind of quickly show you a, a live version, but uh, you can pretty much search for, um, for any chemical in this search window up here and it will start populating the name. So if I wanted to look for uh, um, aflatoxin, I just start typing the name and it will identify any of the other aflatoxin samples that are in here and you can um, navigate to that. Um, but um, the, uh, the other advantage uh, we think of this platform um, is that um, it's, uh, it's very scalable, um, so we can continue to add more signatures uh, in, the, um, in the background database. Uh, and it, it also, uh, we are setting it up as a platform so that uh, if there are any organizations with proprietary data, um, we can add that proprietary data and create a signature database, which has all of the public data plus your proprietary legacy transcriptomics data, and you can perform uh, this sort of read across behind your organizational firewall um, um, so that you can take advantage both of the public signatures as well as some non-public data, which is proprietary to your organization. Um, and, and our methodology, our clustering approach, uh, our calculation, can very nicely incorporate um, proprietary data of any platform with the public data and, and, and provide a, a, an enhanced signature database for analysis. So, um, so I'm, I'm at that slide actually. This is my uh, summary of uh, the main perturbation network analysis. Uh, we're continuing to add more signatures to the database. Uh, we are continuing to um, do uh, work to make all of these signatures uh, work with each other even though they come from different platforms so that we can have a platform 
agnostic uh, novel read across method. Um, and we would love to do more case studies. So if uh, any one of you on the call have any data set uh, and you would like to you know, do a, a case study with us, please contact us uh, and let us know so that we can see how the method works, uh, perhaps use that to improve the method, uh, do a publication and such. Um, and uh, I can pause here and take questions. I actually have a couple of more slides, uh, Connie or uh, Carolyn, depending on you know what you tell me. Uh, some other research that we're doing is actually uh, to do causal network analysis, um, but this requires um, a, an annotated causal network. Um, so perhaps uh, I can keep this for, for next time because this is a whole topic which will take multiple slides for me to go through. I'm just checking my time and we only have five minutes left. Um, so, um, you know, causal network analysis, the advantage of this, I'll just, I'll just say it in 30 seconds and then I can pause, is that um, we can actually uh, uh, compare your transcriptomic data, run it through the causal network analysis to identify what particular subnetwork of genes um, um, are modulating uh, the downstream uh, genes uh, and whether your treatment uh, agrees with what is known uh, as a directional network or, is, uh, or if it disagrees. Uh, and this, this can be used as a very powerful method uh, for mechanism of action characterization. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge for causal network analysis right now is to have uh, well annotated uh, pathways with directionality and causality uh, made available. Uh, but we are working on methodologies to be able to do this very effectively. In fact, we have run some uh, uh, case studies with a uh, couple of uh, companies who uh, do not allow me to name them, uh, but, but we've had some success at um, performing causal network analysis uh, on a limited set of networks that were well annotated. Um, so I'll just pause there. Um, I guess I walked through a lot of stuff. I, I hope I made sense. Uh, but the take-home message is that uh, we are continuing to do research to come up with toxicogenomics data analysis pipeline, uh, going from data acquisition down all the way down to connectivity or network analysis type of methods. Um, and I'll stop uh, at this slide uh, to acknowledge that a lot of this work uh, was motivated uh, and supported by um, you know, folks like Scott, who's on the call, but others also, Rick Paulus, Alex Merrick. A um, lot of uh, insightful conversations over the years with also some people at EPA, Josh Harrell and Richard Judson and Rusty. A um, lot of the curation work to get the signatures ready is done by folks like David, Lauren, Deborah, and others. Uh, these are all the life scientists uh, who work uh, at SIOM. Um, uh, and a lot of the methods work is done by Deepak, whose picture is right here. I think he's on the call with me. Um, and Diral and Brian, um, and also Austin and Alex Sedik uh, have helped out. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge all the contributors. And I think in a few minutes that we have, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Rusher. Um, we have, I think we have one question on the chat. Um, it says, how do you annotate the compounds in your signature collection? And can I collect signatures based on toxicology findings? Um, I actually opened the chat, which... From Dr. So, Yao, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yes, good question, uh, Dr. Yao. Um, we annotate compounds based on the metadata that's provided by whoever submitted this uh, transcriptomics data to the public domain. So a lot of academicians or government or companies who generate transcriptomics data they usually end up either publishing it or submitting it to GEO or Short Read Archive. And they uh, also, as part of the submission to GEO, have to follow the GEO uh, submission template, which has, uh, you have to you know, provide sample level information. Um, so we uh, actually have both a manual process and also some data-driven, actually, data science approach um, to, to mine that information and, and, and create some clear metadata. Um, so that's how the compound names, their doses, uh, their uh, test system, and all of the metadata that you saw on the browser are, are collected and provided. 
So for any given compound, if I click on it, um, you know, this might not be a good example, but say I just randomly picked a sample, you can see on the left bottom corner, um, all this information is, is collected from the metadata for the study. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is Shen Yu. I'm just I'm thinking. Do you think we can add to further aggregate the signatures based on compound class instead of just at the individual compound level? Because compounds share the same toxicity, right? We shall extract their shared signature. Then can be more accurate. I think for different uh, applications, uh, yes, uh, different approaches can be taken. Um, uh, if you had a very strong notion to believe that certain set of compounds, because they share a mode of action or they are within a class that is very tightly defined and should be collapsed into one group, then yes, signatures can be combined. But the power of this approach is to not having to do that, that you if the, if the transcriptomic output from let's say five different compounds, which, which suppose, supposedly are of the same type, uh, if they are of the same type, if they share mode of action, then their transcriptomic readout should be very similar. And, and therefore, those five compounds should I, I actually disagree on that one. Okay. There, well, I, I, well, go ahead, you finish. No, my, my point was that we want to we want to be able to see uh, which compound is the closest match to your query, right? Um, and and if you think that that is better achieved by combining certain samples, uh, that's certainly possible. I'll give you an example. There a lot of these data sets that we have combined here have replicates, right? Usually there are three replicates, um, and we have collapsed those replicates. Um, so if if there was a reason to further collapse data points to create less data points for signature analysis, that's possible. But that type of information would have to come from you, from an expert who would guide us to say that for this particular application, I believe that you know, we should further combine uh, signatures into, into smaller groups. Yeah. Uh, um, Dr. Shah, thanks for the presentation. I'll follow up with you. Offline. Yes, please thanks. do. I, I would love to uh, hear more about your thoughts and, 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 and reasoning. Okay, bye. Um, I think I see. Um, okay, Carol uh, said thank you, and Cam, uh, Johnson, Kamin Johnson says, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he had a question. I think he left. I think we're at the top of the hour now, and a lot of people have to run to other meetings. Um, yes. Uh, Maybe you can answer that really quickly, how close equates same toxicity, um, and, then, and then we can adjourn the call. So that's, that's a million dollar question also, right? Because, uh, um, so I didn't quite get into it because I was worried about you know, running out of time, but um, so, so how close is actually going to be answered by two uh, quantitative outputs that we have. We calculate a score and we calculate a p-value. Um, so, ah, there is another large question here, but um, based on the score and the p-value, if, if that is statistical significant, then we would consider that it is close, close enough. Now, is that close enough or a statistical significance really equates to same toxicity is a question that we need to further investigate through many different case studies so we can identify whether that sort of a read across can always be considered or what is the safe zone within which read across can be done right so the traditional read across is based on structural similarity but then they go through other layers of information which is not inherently uh, conveyed by the structure so you know add me properties um, and, and other such things um, the advantage of read across to transcriptomics is that uh, some of that information about you know how well the chemical uh, was able to uh, enter the cells uh, and and permeability for example is all inherently hopefully part of the transcriptomic readout because that's the the effect of uh, the 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 exposure of the chemical is what leads to the changes in the expression but but that that question is definitely something that requires further research so we do have statistical significance, but does statistical significance really 
uh, mean same toxicity is something that that needs further uh, evaluation. So Carolina, there is another question uh, here. Uh, would you like me to read it? Jason O'Brien, I think. Yeah, um, Jason. Jason, you're welcome to also um, unmute yourself and, and ask the question. I'm okay to stick uh, to stay on the call um, and get this one answered. Sure. I, I indicated that I can follow up with an email if we're out of time. But um, your your presentation throughout your presentation, and um, especially when you uh, mentioned the causal analysis, um, some some bells were kind of ringing in my head about how this could align with the adverse outcome pathway framework. And uh, basically, I'm, I, I think this could provide um, excellent weight of evidence in, in that particular framework. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with with AOPs at all, but have, have, are you familiar with AOPs? And if so, have you considered how this can apply to that that framework? So I'm I'm somewhat familiar with AOPs. I, as I said, I'm not a toxicologist, but um, I have sat in many different seminars of AOPs and tried to uh, keep up with it. Um, but but you're right. I think uh, especially if we move towards the uh, the causal analysis, then then uh, AOP framework could benefit or provide us with uh, the type of causal networks that we need as a starting point to be able to do the causal inference. So for us to do the, the, the causal network analysis, we need well annotated networks. And they're actually, uh, what we need is way more detailed of a network than what AOP usually provides. Uh, but, um, you know, AOP focused causal network analysis is possible if we uh, focus more on the molecular initiating events, the, the left side of the AOP, um, and really break it down into each individual protein or a gene that participates in those steps of the AOP, then perhaps that can be used. So I, I, I agree with you. I think it needs uh, something I would love to discuss more in detail. One, one last comment, quick comment about that is that the, the whole promise of AOPs is a little bit of a chicken and the egg issue. Um, mm -hmm. People want great AOPs, but they have to develop great AOPs before they can use them. And I, I think this tool offers um, both ends of that of that problem, developing AOPs and applying AOPs. So I Correct. think there's a lot of potential here. So very cool stuff. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think, uh, you, you know, I'll follow up via email to see if you have more comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Richard, so much for joining us for the ESA webinar series and crafting and delivering this great presentation to our members. Um, we are recording this, so we will share with everyone in case um, someone was not able to join. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me and thanks for all the questions. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, thank you.